design. How will the pandemic change how buildings are designed and built? And um, if I, could you go to the next slide, please? Tracy? Yep. Next slide. Yep, hold on. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, um, our speakers are um, Mike DeRyne with Fitzgerald & Associates Architect, Steve Razabek, uh, partner at Papa George Himes, Himes, I always say Himes, but it's Himes, uh, Nicholas Spohr is a senior associate at Callison, RTKL, and Jeff Goulet is a design principal at SGW Architecture and Design. And um, as we've done here, as we build this, is a uh, what we just like to have is a discussion about what the architecture community is hearing from their clients and among their own uh, people. What should we be looking forward to in the future? You know, we've all had the last two to three months at home, uh, learning a new way of doing business, and so now we're going to find out a new way of hopefully building buildings in a healthy and safe way. So Mike, if you would, lead things off. Good afternoon. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm Mike DeRowan. I'm president of Fitzgerald Associates Architects. Happy to be here today to talk with you about uh, some of the things that we've learned and some of the things that we are learning uh, about how we're going to uh, design the house in the future. But uh, Tracy, if you go to the next slide. Over the past uh, month or so, we did an informal survey of people uh, that are living in apartments, and we found uh, uh, something very interesting, uh, and that is it's about a 50-50 split on whether or not people feel like they should be living in apartments or will Next want slide. to live in apartments uh, in the future. Tracy, next slide. Okay, Mike. So, um, you know, this has led to uh, a lot of interesting discussion about uh, what what things are we going to see that are different in apartment living. Uh, we've all been doing this for the last 14 or so weeks, and um, I think some of us have been may do easier than others. Uh, some of us are working from our kitchen tables. Some of us are working from an, a spare bedroom and some of us are working from our bedrooms. And that, that has been certainly a challenge for, for anyone, um, not to mention the, uh, the compounded population of everyone being at home uh, and working on top of one another. And in apartment living, one of the things that we're seeing that is going to be necessary to really consider is just how do all of those feelings about working from home, how are they going to impact the, the residence that you live in, whether it be an apartment, a townhome, a single family, a, a mid-rise, a high-rise. And within those spaces, are there amenities that have been shut down like in some of the buildings and how will those things be impacted in ways that they can be used? You can go to the next slide, please. One of the, the key components to all of, uh, all of this conversation, we believe is gonna be focused and centered around healthy living. And there's two programs, Fit Well and Well Buildings, that many of you may be familiar with. And we're certainly becoming more in depth with our familiarity of both of those programs and how they will impact um, multifamily design. Uh, will the lack of desire to ride in an elevator cause all of us to want? Um, no, will we'll, we'll, uh, the lack of willingness uh, for all of us to ride in an elevator um, mean that there's more uh, of an acceptance of turning one of uh, what was considered just an exit stair that no one will walk in uh, into something that needs to be a focused feature for, um, being a, for transporting people uh, throughout the building? Uh, will that healthy living drive um, push amenities to be, uh, rather than congregated in single large uh, areas within a, a single building, will they be driven to be in, you know, what we're talking, 
calling neighborhoods within the building so that they're to separate locations so that they can be opened and closed in, in ways that allow residents to continue to use them rather than one large space uh, that just gets closed off because it's, it's uh, unsafe for its utilization. And will those neighborhoods within a building be interconnected by stairs to encourage residents to use them uh, and add to their own wellness uh, rather than taking an elevator? If you can go to the next slide, Tracy. The other thing that we believe is, is going to be uh, in our short term future uh, outside of you know, the plexiglass and, and cleaning supplies that, uh, that are occupying everyone's uh, new offices and apartments uh, are smaller buildings. And will the, the desire uh, and ability to build smaller apartment buildings change how we approach those buildings so that they can be um, aggregated in a, in a management way so as to be able to provide more, uh, the same types of services that you might find only in a high rise uh, apartment building. And through the use of the various property tech uh, apps that are out there, you know, will those enable people to be able to really utilize and gain access to uh, the same types of amenities and services that can be found typically only in large high rise apartment buildings? And is it those services that actually drove the, that 1% response uh, to our question about really wanting to live in apartment buildings? Uh, is it that, that service segment uh, that can only be maybe obtained right now in a, a large uh, high rise multifamily building? Um, but if they were, can that be uh, provided you know, to a multitude of small neighborhood buildings if they're close enough together. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of uh, interesting conversation about how we need to be compassionate and understanding of the fear that we are all experiencing in different, different ways uh, of how we're going to want to interact with one another in the future and what does that truly mean to the, the different um, solutions that we're all going to arrive at um, as, as we sort of enter into this next normal, whenever that really starts. Next step. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. And now let's hear from Steve Rezebeck with Papa George Haynes. All right. Thank you, Paul. And good afternoon, everyone. We certainly appreciate your joining us for this discussion. So uh, I'm Steve Rezebeck, partner of Papa George Haynes Partners. And for those of you who may not be too familiar with us. We're about a 40 person architecture firm located in River North with a particular expertise in multifamily housing uh, with projects both locally here in the Chicago area as well as projects in many other cities across the nation. Uh, next slide. So the COVID-19 pandemic is obviously a relatively new phenomena for all of us and um, it's resulted in some responses that are at odds with trends we've seen over the past several years toward urbanization and smaller, more efficient dwelling unit sizes. You know, it's really uncertain at this point how long the response will last or whether, you know, we may be following this up with, with subsequent episodes. Uh, but the theme that we're hearing uh, with our clients and, you know, certainly a lot of the materials and conversations that, uh, you know, are on, out there is flexibility. And, uh, you know, the, we're, we're working with our clients to develop design solutions that can fulfill the immediate need for social distancing, but can be reconfigured uh, post-COVID-19. Next slide. So our, our practice covers really a broad range of housing types from single family homes, townhomes, flats, uh, low rise buildings and high rise buildings as well. Not every project offers the opportunity to incorporate a dedicated office. And even this solution um, isn't adequate when two or more people are working 
from the same household, as I'm sure we've both experienced with, you know, competing um, web meetings at the same time, trying to share the same office space. So uh, we've all had to adapt uh, out of necessity, you know, converting underutilized spaces such as dining rooms, spare bedrooms, kitchen islands, and even uh, the occasional niche along a hallway uh, to serve as a primary or secondary office space. Next slide. So the question I think we're all asking is, you know, is, is COVID going to result in permanent changes in the way we design buildings and dwelling units? And, you know, so far, I think the information is mostly anecdotal. Uh, I was participating in a recent meeting on a project we have on the boards right now uh, as a response to the need for a home office space that, uh, you know, they were considering redesigning the building, which is currently 100% studio units, averaging probably about 425 square feet, and reconfiguring the building for larger units, maybe at about 650 square feet. So that's a very consequential reaction. You know, it's basically a 30% reduction in density, and, you know, it has the equal impact on an increase in the rent outlay for the future residents. So, you know, one question is, is, is the micro unit trend going to be altered by this response? Or will it require architects and developers to consider alternatives such as more built-ins in the units uh, or incorporating furnishings that are reconfigurable in order to maintain density and maintain affordability? Next slide. Tracy, can we advance to the next slide? Have we lost Tracy? No. Yeah, I don't see her image up on no, the screen. I... Right. Next slide. Well, I'll keep talking, but hopefully the images can catch up. You know, but what we're seeing as more of an immediate impact on building design uh, is, you know, in the circulation areas and the common areas of the building. Uh, you know, we're seeing temporary retrofits uh, for the circulation spaces, which include the use of a lot of painter's tape and, and one-way signage throughout the building. Um, but there are better solutions to these, and uh, I, I suspect most of these other solutions will, will be seeing as more permanent changes to the building. And, you know, this would include touchless access points at uh, all the building entries. Uh, destination dispatch elevator systems, I think, are going to be very common in the future uh, with, you know, they have the ability to be retrofitted with touchless controls. You can even designate, you know, what floor you want to go to through apps on your phone or even your watch. And as Mike indicated, you know, we're seeing you know, stairwells being opened up so that they can serve as an alternative to uh, the use of an elevator. And frankly, that's, that's something that uh, we've been trying to incorporate into our buildings uh, for a while now because you can actually get, uh, you know, innovation points, for example, through the LEED program as well as it's, you know, it's, it's a function of some of the other uh, certification programs as well. You know, we're seeing uh, building operations change pretty dramatically too through incorporation of sanitation stations, stepped up janitorial services, and a lot, of, a lot of discussion regarding modifications to mechanical systems for improved uh, filterization and even consideration of uh, using narrow band UV lighting as a, as a measure for disinfecting the air. Next slide. So nowhere has the impact of COVID been felt more dramatically than on the amenity spaces in the buildings where the response up to now has simply been to close them. And, uh, you know, obviously we don't want to see that continue. There's a lot of, a lot of effort that goes into these spaces and they serve a very important function for the building. So for new projects, um, the more permanent uh, impact we're seeing on these spaces is uh, to make them more easily reconfigured, to, to make the lounge seating 
and community tables so that they can be broken down and split apart for more individualized use and hopefully return to a configuration that permits larger social gatherings. Um, you know, we're seeing similar impact on the building uh, business centers where, uh, you know, if, if a particular unit design doesn't really allow for um, an office space or if there's a need for a secondary office space, you know, the business centers can be equipped with work pods that can serve you know, both as a primary or secondary office. Next slide. Sorry, I don't know why it's sticking. So in, in many of these uh, design considerations for dealing with this are being extended to the outdoor amenity space as well, where, you know, again, these spaces also benefit from having smaller reconfigurable seating arrangements that can be, uh, you know, split apart uh, to improve social distancing, but easily reconfigured uh, for, for larger arrangements as well. Uh, so in conclusion, you know, while we're still in the early stages of our response, design response to COVID-19, you know, the trend is toward maximum flexibility in both the design of the dwelling units and the amenity spaces. You know, in this flexibility, it's a cautious approach for the current situation, but it also offers a sense of optimism that this isn't permanent and that things will return to normal at some point. And so our spaces can be easily reconfigured for that possibility. That's Thank it. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. And now we'll hear from Nicholas Spohr from uh, Callison RTKL. Hi, I'm uh, Nick Spore from a senior associate at Callison RTKL. We're a global design firm that has practices in all regions of the world, um, and we we have a focus on multifamily multifamily housing, along with many other building types. And over the last few weeks, we and all architects have been thinking a lot about how, um, how shelter in place can be a catalyst for a better future. Um, we can go to the next slide. So what we do, where we work, uh, where we live, where we relax and eat and drink and everything is all part of a, has always been part of an ecosystem. And over the last few years, we've seen that ecosystem kind of shift and become a little bit more dense and bring um, more of what you want closer to home. And we feel like this pandemic and being forced to be home uh, is, is a catalyst to hasten the changes that we've seen. So next slide. So before COVID, COVID our home was an anchor at either end of the day. Uh, we spent most of our time in the office and the remainder of time was spent outside the home. You know, our social activities most, most, mostly took outside the home and a lot of times even outside the community. In recent years, we've seen um, multifamily start to amenitize to bring more and more of that um, outside the home activities closer to your doorstep. And we think that um, COVID's kind of made that happen a little, a little bit more quickly. So um, next slide. So emerging from this and looking beyond the pandemic, um, we see the home and the local area being much more present in our, in our ecosystems. So returning to the office will be more flexible. So we'll be home more. And so the new ecosystem will be smaller and closer to home and your neighborhood. Uh, next slide. Being home more all day will require your home to have a lot more adaptability. So like Steve was talking about uh, with flexibility, we see the same kind of trend. So when we're designing units in the future, maybe your kitchen table during the day serves as your work desk and then is easily folded away um, for a quick workout and then set back up for dinner. So this easy adaptability from work to not work is the brief that we see 
of the future. So we see the ecosystem moving to live, work, play, which is what we've been designing to recently to kind of just live, live, live. So everywhere you are is, is where you live. So um, next slide. So that isn't to say that we need to abandon everything that we've learned in the past about multifamily housing or living period. So we just need to kind of take what we've learned from this um, sheltering in place and use it in, in our future design. So for instance, I think we've learned that uh, we can use our homes for fitness and we, we become a lot more conscious about our well-being. Um, so we're gonna wanna see that manifest itself in buildings. Um, so through mechanical systems, through operable, operable windows, we'll see our well-being become much more of a focus. Um, we've embraced the amateur, so we've learned to cook at home. We've learned new skills. We've honed uh, skills that we previously had. So we'll see that start to bring itself into our designs more too. Um, we, work, we can work from home, we can work from anywhere, and we can be productive doing that work. So it's easier to say that, say the office is just as a place where you are maybe two, three times a week, and the rest of the time you're, you're at home so that you can recapture that commute and you can use that for your personal life. So um, we've also discovered community during this time. So I live in the South Loop of Chicago and um, during this, during this um, pandemic, we've seen at seven and then eight as, as it gets darker, um, the whole community comes out and welcomes the first responders and the um, back home with flashing lights and singing songs. And it's, it's amazing. So you can have community even if you have to be six feet apart. And that's, I think, something we'll see more and more of in, in multifamily with, with, um, with um, communal spaces, um, but smart communal spaces. So maybe um, in our amenities, we'll have space for groups, but there'll be smaller groups. And maybe there's more amenities outside. And then we've also embraced tech culture like this, for instance, um, having uh, um, Zoom and and uh, teams. Um, so we'll see um, the importance of having internet, high speed internet connection being brought in. That'll be a focus of our buildings in the past, in the future. And, uh, and so we're seeing that happen even right now in buildings that were designed pre-COVID, we're starting to retrofit them before they're built. So, um, so we think that we'll see all of this work its way into the home of the future. Okay, thank you, Nick. And uh, now we'll hear from Jeff Goulet, uh, Design Principal at SGW Architecture and Design. Jeff? He was having trouble signing on, but I thought he got on. While we're waiting for Jeff, uh, Tracy has already put a note on there We'd like you to type your questions into the chat function of the Zoom. Uh, so you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a little um, cloud, if you will, a little balloon there, it says chat. So please feel free to type your questions in there and we will share them with the group. Uh, Jeff, is he still muted or? Uh, I should be on, I think. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Can okay. You hear you? Yeah. Great. Do I have yeah. a picture? <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you all very much for um, uh, inviting us here today and uh, addressing these very interesting questions. And I think my colleagues have done a great job of covering a sort of global um, uh, look at what's going on. I was going to speak to some more specific uh, examples that we have um, that we've encountered in the last few months in our design practice. Um, so one of the things that uh, one of the areas of the marketplace in multifamily homes that we work in is sort of at the, uh, the higher end of that marketplace that of course makes uh, some of the design challenges of this new age a little bit easier in terms of we had already been including things like uh, office niches and nooks 
uh, as part of a, say like a, a three or four bedroom uh, uh, condominium. Uh, the challenge of course now has been alluded to by several others is that we have to find ways to make that um, able to work with sound separation. So we're, uh, we're now trying to innovate uh, on some of the buildings we have on the boards with incorporating that, uh, that feature. Another thing that we've been curious about and studying a little bit <clears throat> as we move forward in this new age where it's clear that a lot of people are gonna be, as has been alluded to by my uh, peers, working from home, uh, will we be able to do things like perhaps make the master bedroom itself a little bigger so that part of that can serve as a secondary office for um, one, uh, one, one person in a, a couple or partnership? And could the master bedroom closet ultimately begin to, begin to shrink a little bit as our wardrobe needs, uh, since we're not going to the office as frequently, may become a little less uh, pressing of space? So there's some things we're looking at in terms of that, um, in terms of that. Sorry, I guess my camera is showing the wrong view here. Uh. <laughs> well, we thought your empty office was making a statement, Jeff. Yeah, right. Apparently. That, Social that, distancing. A statement. Uh, I know it's not flipping, but anyway. Um, so we're looking at the other thing that's been mentioned, I think Mike brought it up, is the concept of neighborhoods within larger buildings. And a number of the um, uh, buildings that we're doing have already been structured that way. It's been very popular uh, in the marketplace at the higher end to see elevators that at each floor serve only a couple of units. And a, a building that maybe has 72 units might uh, actually have six elevator banks so that uh, you know only 12 units are clustered around each of those elevators. It sounds very uneconomical to build, uh, but it has been tremendously popular at the higher end of the market. Um, we're wondering if there isn't a way that that can be brought, and again, Mike, I think uh, alluded to this a bit, so that buildings at other spectrums of the market can also incorporate that kind of neighborhood approach so that uh, one is not often on the elevator or waiting for the elevator with a larger group of people. Um, that's something that we're, we're looking at trying to uh, make as an innovation. Uh, in another part of our practice, um, we've actually been working for some years with, um, with Mars Wrigley uh, in their Global uh, Innovation Center, which was built about 20 years ago. And they've been doing a sequence of, of rehab projects there and updating projects. Since their staff has all been away, one of, the, um, one of the places we've been assisting them in the last couple of months has been a reconcept plan for the um, restrooms at each floor. Fortunately, their restrooms were fairly sizable, uh, seven or eight stall bathrooms. The facility serves about 900 staff, 300 per floor. Um, and so because they were pretty spacious, uh, they've been able to be reconfigured so that instead of partitions, now walls, full height walls have been introduced around uh, all of the stalls. And we've been able to rework the bathroom flow of people so that there's a, it's almost like uh, if you think about the bathrooms at Wrigley Field, there's a one way entrance and a one way exit. So people are brought through in, in a single direction. We were able to uh, take over a piece of a formerly very spacious sort of common gathering area, which in this new world is judged by them to be unlikely to get uh, anything like as much use as it formerly enjoyed. So we were able to kind of make that change. But one of the things that has occurred to us in doing that is whether that will open us up to maybe uh, more of a unisex uh, restroom approach in a larger facility like that, because the needs that are private are all separated into separate walled completely privatized uh, rooms, if you will. So that's been a sort of interesting experience coming out of uh, our work with that company. And uh, I think those are, that's a pretty good summary of some of the, some of the things we've been, we've been studying and working on. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And we're gonna go to the um, uh, questions have been submitted on the chat function. Um, since COVID-19 coincides with the generational shift with more Gen Z renters entering the market, 
Are there any implications from the expected switch from the millennials driving the market to this new generation doing so? Um, I'll open it, um, Steve or Mike or Nick, Jeff, who wants to jump in? Well, I'll take a stab at part of a response. Uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, it, it kind of raises the importance of the community amenity space in these buildings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, right now, as I mentioned, these spaces are typically closed and offering the residents very little opportunity to participate in any sense of community in the buildings. So, you know, I think uh, some of the solutions that we, we've all discussed in terms of, you know, making these spaces reconfigurable so that they can be reopened again, but uh, in a way that maintains some form of safe social distancing is important. I, I think, you know, this, the, the difference between millennials and Gen Z also probably puts a little more importance on the management of some of the buildings in terms of some of the, the functions that they try to organize uh, within the building to maintain that sense of community. Is this an end to amenities war or not? Is, I mean, developers talk about the amenities war of trying to provide so many goodies out there for tenants. Is that day over? No, that, that day's no. Over. No. <laughs> People love no. amenities. We just have to have, um, we just have to be more mindful of, of what the amenities are. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, I don't think it'll just be big open spaces with a couple ch tables and chairs. I mean, it'll be kind of smarter amenities. Right. No, I, I completely agree, Nick. It, the impact of Gen Z, I think, is going to be a very interesting one because the the oldest Gen Z are just entering the workforce, right? Maybe maybe in the last two years. But the majority of Gen Z is in high school and college. So how is that going to impact their thinking about living, given the fact that they've had to live through this in a variety of different ways, either at home or in college, or being sent back home from college to live back at home and finishing their classes online? Um, they're, they're, the, the demographics for Gen Z are, are, are very, very large. They rival the size of uh, the baby boomers, depending on what years you want to actually count, since they're never consistent. Um, and so I think that one of the biggest impacts we're going to see is a continued uh, increase in, in demand for new housing uh, because household formations through Gen Z are going to continue to um, expand what the millennials have been doing to the market. Uh, it is going to create a lot of opportunity, I think, in all spectrums of housing because of where we are now with baby boomers really entering into their, their senior years and what that's going to do for senior housing in addition to, you know, who's going to take over the home? What's going to happen to all those single family homes? You know, are the millennials going to buy their parents' homes? I think that's a question that's unanswered as they start now forming their own families. And some of them are starting to realize that maybe they don't want to live in vertical high rise living. Well, um, you know, want to continue living close to work. I couldn't agree more with Nick that um, reducing commute times is going to be ever present on everyone's mind, uh, even more so now. Okay, thank you. Any other responses on that question? Okay, Tracy, we'll go to the next one. Uh, we have a question from Corey Robertson, and the question is, to what extent does the city seem amenable to adjusting permitted but unbuilt amenity space? Um, the city is, um, doesn't, um, how can you say this? City doesn't <clears throat> respond as quickly as, as um, other entities to change. So, they're responding the same way they would have responded if there wasn't a pandemic. Anyone else? Slowly. <laughs> Slowly. Okay. You yeah, have to go I would get a revise, or you have to go revise your permit just like you would have any other time. Yeah. I would just add that you know amenity spaces bring with them uh, specific exit egress requirements that uh, 
you know, as long as a building is designed to meet the future demand, you know, they could be repurposed for other uses as long as uh, that other purpose doesn't um, dramatically change the occupancy requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, from uh, Raheel Ahmad, um, could amenity spaces in apartment buildings lean toward becoming co-working spaces? Because sometimes working from home becomes a real challenge because of kids, noise, etc. So as you talk about reconfiguring, are we looking at more private spaces in those amenity areas? I think, I think in, uh, there's an, oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, I think with, there was already a trend towards co-working um, moving into the, into uh, as an amenity. And I think that, like, um, like I said before, I think that this is just hastening that process. So I think people are going to want, definitely want to have a space outside of their unit, but still in their building where they can, they can work. Yeah, we have an example um, that's just about to start construction that we've been doing a little bit of reconfiguring of because uh, reacting to this crisis, the developer has uh, wanted us to take over a part of the formerly open amenity space and create a sort of WeWork style, um, you know, almost phone booth uh, elements within that space so that those are available to the tenants because of the need for acoustic privacy. So I think small adaptations like that will become much more commonplace. Sure. Yeah, I think the, the only issue you sometimes run into um, with that is, you know, sometimes when you have that kind of open WeWork uh, lounge space, that space is often made available to uh, the residents to sometimes rent out for uh, a party or some type of social event. And so we're finding it sometimes helpful to still be able to maintain a separate business center that can remain uh, available to the residents of the building while an event like that might be going on. But it is yeah. nice to be able to co-mingle the two. Right, well, and, and the interesting thing has been that the creation of these booths has been sort of almost like an old fashioned hotel that yeah. used to have those kind of fairly sizable and luxury, you know, these won't be luxury, but it sort of reminds me of that where they had really cool old phone booths that you could go into. That's a, that's a kind of throwback thing. Sure but still within the overall amenity space. But if you can go into that, even if there is a, a party going on in the party room part, you can still use that with some degree of privacy. Yeah, I wish I had a private phone booth sometimes in my own home. That'd be great. <laughs> okay, next question. So we have a question from Brian Kidd at Papa George. How do you think that this pandemic will affect the future condo market? In the immediate short term, um, because uh, fortunately a number of the buildings that are just going into the marketplace right now that we've been working on are, are featuring units of larger scale, there has been a real rush to those in the market. The bigger, we, we reconfigured a building that formerly had two duplex penthouse units to uh, turn it into a building with 12 duplex penthouse units around 3,200 square feet. And all but two of those have sold in the last few weeks. So wow. that's been a sort of extraordinary, I think people are feeling uh, confined in their you know, relatively uh, smaller spaces. And so that's certainly been an interesting um, push in the marketplace, at least in the short term. Well, the apartment yeah, market has always had a push for more outside space, more balconies, you know, when you talk about open doors and windows, I mean, is that part of this design push too? People wanting more outdoor spaces? Well, I, I think it is for the condo market. You know, there was already a trend toward going to smaller boutique style condominium buildings, which I think uh, will still be attractive even in this environment. Uh, and typically those units did feature fairly significant outdoor space uh, with that. But, you know, that, that's one of the things I've been thinking about is will there be a push on, you know, larger, more dense uh, apartment buildings to start uh, incorporating more balcony space uh, into the, uh, for the individual dwelling units and uh, I'm not convinced that's a trend we're gonna see make a big resurgence here quite yet.
Anyone you know, else? One other thing I would add that kind of ties in with um, what Jeff was experiencing is that uh, we too have uh, been hearing from some of our clients some anecdotal evidence of sales of units that have individual entries like townhome units in the city and even the surrounding suburbs have picked up fairly dramatically uh, over the past couple months here. And uh, certainly for those those developers that operate in that arena, they have a, a new sense of optimism, um, even in these, you know, current times. Okay, thank you. Um, another question to, uh, well, I lost it. Uh, chat box moved on me. Uh, but all, um, will all CRTKL office, offices undergo rearrangement based on social distancing? <laughs> phenomenon you laugh steve is that one of your co-workers <laughs> <laughs> no i think the crtkl that's where i work oh i'm sorry um, nick nick uh that's probably one of your co-workers i'm yeah, sorry yeah maybe i'm i <laughs> i imagine yeah i mean I, i'm sure there's going to be a bunch of i think they're still figuring that out i think like everyone is they're still figuring out how we return to work i know that it, at least at the beginning and probably for the foreseeable future um, our return uh, to work will be flexible. So um, we'll be uh, able to kind of uh, work from home more often. Uh, but I, I don't, I'm sure there's going to be some kind of uh, overall discussion about that that's probably happening right now. I, I, I mean, I know, um, yeah, that's about my my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we have a market question. Um, developers and investors, how are they responding as far as projects are concerned? Have we as architects been able to convince them to resume projects, funding? What are their fears and apprehensions? What is your overall observation about the market for multifamily, I assume? No, we, we've seen a, a, a resurgence of a few projects that stopped back in March. Um, but those projects that are trying to come back to life are doing so slowly, deliberately, uh, and with real focus on um, taking the right steps to get things aligned so that they can be prepared for you know, the upslope of the next cycle. It will happen. It's just a matter of time. Uh, but they're in A plus locations. And so I, I've been saying, you know, it goes back to the old axiom of real estate is location, location, location is going to drive the first projects back to the market. Uh, those B plus locations that looked good a year ago because they were different and, and maybe could have performed a better um, may not be the first ones back, but the ones in the certainly in the A plus location are starting to. Um, Anybody with a long enough lens to look at the life, you know, the life cycle of one of these developments, it takes, you know, it takes a year to get the zoning completed, right? And I think we can all kind of agree that that's about how long it takes for these things to, to gestate. No matter how hard we push them, we might be able to shorten that, you know, by some number of months. But anyone that's still looking at, you know, an investment grade, uh, apartment building has got to be looking at the long term and realizing that this is passing it will pass and we will move forward again how quickly they'll all you know pony up to move beyond just a zoning effort remains to be seen well that brings me back to a comment that one of you made earlier trying to decide about what's going to be permanent or not about the changes you're seeing and considering is there anything you can say right now is going to be a permanent change uh, because of uh, the pandemic and our change of how we work? Anything you feel at this point that's going to be a permanent? Well, we've all talked about it, but the work from home aspect of this seems to me and to those in our firm to be a pretty permanent change. We had already tiptoed in our firm to um, having our senior staff able to work from home uh, to some degree, but this has been, and it's been alluded to or mentioned by everyone else, you know, people who have young families and not having to have commute time. And 
all of those sorts of things. And we've been very pleased with how efficient we believe our office has, has been able to remain being with the remote work experience given features, um, you know, like the one we're enjoying here. Right. And I, I would add that, uh, you know, with regard to higher density buildings, uh, anything touchless, I think we're going to see a lot more emphasis on low voltage Absolutely. touchless controls throughout the building. Okay. What can be done with this, right, Steve? That's right. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> well, it looks like we've run out of questions from the audience. So um, what I'm going to do now is give you each an opportunity to make some closing remarks and we'll go in reverse order. So Jeff, you get to go first. Any other closing <laughs> observations for us? Um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the joys of working in the field that we do has always been the ability to innovate quickly on the part of our, our whole industry. Uh, we may accept the government side of it, given the comments I'm seeing here on the chat, but um, you know, developers are, are generally quite good innovators. And I think we can all use this as a means of improving everyone's ultimate quality of life. I think it's kind of shattered the mold in many ways. So once we're forced into a situation like that, we can, we can always look to the positive and I'm sure that we can come out of this with a lot of positive effect. Okay, Nick. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that um, I think that in there will be um, some good um, that comes out of this um, pandemic, and um, I think that um, being smart about what what aspects that we, what we've learned from our time working from home to incorporate, those will be the successful projects moving forward. Okay, Steve. Well, I think we've all, you know, read and heard about uh, what a huge boom this has been for industries like the bicycle industry. And I think this is really just accelerating the trend toward better integrating wellness and healthy lifestyles into the buildings we design and, you know, making proper accommodation uh, for that trend to continue. Well, Mike, you get the last word. Um, well, you guys all took all the good answers. Um, I, I agree with everything you guys are saying. I do think that it also is, and this may seem counter to what you're reading and hearing about city hotspots, but I think it also, because of people really considering their commutes, I think it's going to continue to drive urbanization and, and cities. Um, all the benefits of living in a city are still there and being able to have access to, um, you know, the, the cultural events, the, um, the shopping needs, the playful needs and, and the work needs uh, all come from living in a city. I don't see that trend reversing. I think the only thing that will, will change is some of the positive aspects that everyone, you know, just alluded to. Uh, that will be a more healthy living for all of us. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone uh, on behalf of the Home Builders Association and our annual sponsors of Decor, uh, Chase and Moen. We appreciate everyone joining us today and especially appreciate our um, presenters, our panelists. I wish we had a way to do a online thank you uh, of applause from everyone. We don't, but this has been a very good and lively discussion. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing from us soon about another program. It was suggested earlier that we might talk about more of some of the operational sides of buildings that architects will have an, and engineers will have a voice in. Uh, so we may address that in the near future. With, this, uh, with that, I wanna say uh, thank you very much everyone for joining us. Have a good day, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, hopefully we'll see each other in person sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Thank Thanks you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank thank you Paul. Thank you.